Okay. All right. Well, it's eight o'clock, so we will kick off Grand Rounds um, and to uh, introduce our um, invited guest speaker, uh, who will be talking about the, the hot topic of long COVID, is Dr. Christine Sharkey from our Division of Rheumatology. Christine? Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you for coming today, and thank you, Dr. Calabrese, for um, being here with us today. Uh, Dr. Calabrese heads the Cleveland Clinic's section of clinical immunology and manages its clinical immunology clinic, specializes in diseases of the immune system, the intersection of infectious disease as well as rheumatology in, um, um, in the immune system. And Dr. Calabrese is also co-director of the uh, Center for Vasculitis Care and Research and has particular interest in vascular inflammatory disease of the nervous system. He's a graduate of the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences. Dr. Calabrese performed his internal medicine training at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, followed by a fellowship in rheumatic and immunologic disease. He's a recipient of numerous awards, honorary doctorate of human letters from the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences, the Phillips Medal of Public Service from the Ohio University College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Bruce Hubbard Stewart Award for Humanitarianism, and the Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award from the Arnold P. Gold MD Foundation. So we are so happy and honored to have you here today, Dr. Calabrese, to uh, talk to us about long COVID and its intersection with immunology. Thank you. Hey, great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's it's always my privilege uh, to um, give uh, a talk at Medical Grand Rounds. And I can't think of a more appropriate topic, uh, which is uh, interdisciplinary. So are the disclosures. Um, this is the... Uh, reading from my center, and uh, any of you that are interested in uh, long COVID and the intersection with uh, ME-CFS and dysautonomia, uh, or aspect any aspects of immunology or the science of empathy, uh, please follow me on Twitter. And uh, I was happy to... Um, be reached out by email, which is uh, available for you. So in the next few minutes, uh, <laughs> top, tackle this topic, which is, you know, unprecedented uh, as part of the influx of knowledge of SARS-CoV-2. You know, in less than a thousand days, there have been over 400,000 uh, peer-reviewed articles written on the total topic of COVID, you know, that compares to rheumatoid arthritis, which has been the disease that our profession in rheumatology has been focused on, which in, not, since 1966 has poured out 164,000 articles. Probably 10, somewhere between five and 10% of those articles of 400,000 are on long COVID. This is just a PubMed search. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of the controversies um, that surround this, uh, the relationship to other pre-existing diseases. And then I'll talk about some putative pathogenic mechanisms and talk about some interesting stuff in therapy. Um, uh, again, these are my guys. Um, so I want to talk about what it is since, you know, it, there we lack at the moment um, agreed upon classification criteria and spin off about epi um, and some of the clinical endotypes before going into pathogenesis and treatment. So here's here's COVID and you know we're at a very good point in COVID right now, uh, decrease in pathogenicity of new variants, uh, but it has not gone away. And as everyone knows, it is not going to have gone away, it, it going to go away. Uh, and will be with us um, in, in perpetuity, uh, no doubt. And when people get SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, they go from some degree of health uh, through either uh, asymptomatic, posse-symptomatic, uh, moderate to severe or critical illness, and then come out the other side, uh, hopefully. Um, small amount of people are dying, mostly immunocompromised patients, um, and they recover. Uh, the recovery is not the same in all people. 
uh, it occurs at a different pace. Um, and there is residual, um, uh, uh, both damage at the level of the tissue and persistent symptoms experienced by, you know, a palpable percentage of people who have gone through this, that is the matrix that from which we draw our inferences about long COVID. This is a, a wonderful slide that kind of uh, shows that, you know, what we are really talking about is that as we recover from this respiratory infection, have we developed developed sequelae. And sequelae are, you know, any condition which is the consequence of a previous disease or injury. And um, to kind of set the stage even more fundamentally, um, it can either be pathologically based, you know, there's data that there's an increased incidence of type 1, type 2 diabetes, uh, hypercoagulability and stroke, things that are that we understand on a pathologic basis. But the bulk, and where I will focus on today, is uh, this syndromic um, notion of long COVID, which is a collection of symptoms which can either mildly or profoundly affect quality of life, which at least at the moment do not have a well-defined pathologic basis that we can draw on. And, and, and I think everyone knows what I'm talking about at this juncture. Now, to start this discussion, and I shout this article out, which is now you know, a little over a year old. Uh, this was my top article um, of 2022, Nature Medicine uh, by Akiko Iwasaki and her colleagues at Yale, um, which I think if you haven't read it, it I strongly uh, recommend this to you. Uh, and it makes the point that um, what we are seeing in terms of long COVID, as we will discuss, is you know rather canonical uh, and reflects other forms of post-infectious syndromes that we have recognized uh, in varying degrees for a long, long time. Um, you know, uh, there these also have been rife with controversy. Probably could date this back to 1956 with the epidemic of unexplained illness at the Royal Free Hospital into the mid 80s with the epidemic of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome from Incline Village um, and uh, 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 many other um, disorders that are associated with these post infectious sequelae. Now, some of these are pathogen specific. You know, early on with uh, originator strain and Delta, uh, anosmia and agusia uh, really defined uh, with great uh, specificity um, a post infectious sequelae of, our, uh, of this infection. Um, a, and a uh, alpha virus um, uh, known as chikungunya. Um, uh, in 50 to 60 percent of people can develop a uh, arthritis that can be quite devastating um, in the wake of recovery. Um, Ebola, which is a you know cataclysmically serious disease, can reactivate um, uh, you know months to years later uh, with corneal disease and Coxsackie B, somewhat similar. So um, other diseases. Uh, that I've listed on here from this um, wonderful paper, um, including SARS-CoV-2, share another phenotype. Um, and call it what you will, MECFS is really the official name for this, and I'll come back to it. Um, it's a syndrome characterized by varying degree, degrees of fatigue with post-exertional features, non-restorative sleep, neurocognitive dysfunction, often accompanied by pain, and can be seen with a number of pathogens. So uh, these diseases, which have long been marginalized in medicine and both research and care, are now getting newfound interest and respect. So when we talk about long COVID as being one of these post-infectious sequelae, what is it? Well, as I will point out here, there are many definitions. And uh, up until right now, um, you know, it, it, are these uh, uh, 
the World Health Organization is probably the most widely endorsed, which said that you have to have symptoms usually three months from the onset of the disease, lasting at least two months, and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. You know, you didn't have a stroke and you can't think uh, uh, that you, you have neurocognitive dysfunction. Um, but other definitions say maybe it should be one month, whether it should be two months or three months or four months. Um, and what are those unexplained symptoms? This is where the difficulty now is, is uh, raging. Um, you know, this is a, a figure uh, ripped off of a high impact nature publication. I, I don't see the citation on here, but probably most of you have seen this figure um, showing, you know, relative impact of the over 50 symptoms um, that, people had defined in this large, from this large meta-analysis um, that remained unexplained, everything from anxiety to fatigue, to hair loss, to uh, joint pain uh, or palpitations, et cetera. More recently, more recently, um, a high impact publication, uh, Nature Reviews of Microbiology that I'll show you, has suggested that there are over 200 symptoms. And I, I actually don't know what 200 symptoms actually means um, um, that could be uh, unexplained. So uh, 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 we'll, we'll come back to that. But I, I'm trying to point out the difficulties to set up the controversies of doing this. This is a really interesting blog uh, by the, actually this is, this is a, a paper from uh, BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine from the uh, very famous and controversial um, blogger uh, Vainé Prasad is a professor of medicine, UCSF. And uh, while I don't often agree with him totally, um, he always uh, has some things in here that are uh, that he publishes that have uh, underlying truth. And this is showing just a summary of the methodologic pitfalls that have created widespread understanding about long COVID. And that has largely to do with nosology, um, lack of uh, uh, accepted classification criteria, which are the fundamental tools of uh, doing uh, clinical and translational research um, and uh, just showing inherent contradictions. So we'll move along. So what is the epi of long COVID? You know, how many people have it? If you Wikipedia, it, it says it's somewhere between five and 50% of people that have had COVID, just to show you what the... Um, uh, the, the, the common discussion is. Uh, I've already outlined these challenges. And again, it starts at the top, no diagnostic or classification criteria. Now I must say that the Recover Project is making an effort and they have put forth a model um, that was rigorously defined, uh, not uh, universally agreed upon. And that now uh, there is a deep and serious uh, um, deliberations going on uh, by the National Academy of Sa Science and the uh, um, Institute of Medicine uh, that I expect to see before the end of the year. But even without those classification criteria, many uh, studies are based upon merely a self-reported single symptom. Um, others are harvested from EMRs, and which are severely limited because you know, while we have an ICD code, if what you code and I code may be very different. Um, many studies were done by patients uh, solicited through social media, which will be highly biased, um, um, and uh, different uh, locales and health systems uh, will influence this. So again, on the left, non-syndromic sequelae um, um, uh, uh, versus um, um, uh, and these are organ-based complications and syndromic, which I'll talk about, um, which uh, at least to this point uh, do not have defined pathology. So with that limitation, this is a part of uh, uh, the, the United States Pulse Survey. Uh, this is done collaboratively with the Census Bureau and periodically over the last few years, they have sent out um, random screening to you know uh, millions of people, um, 
who varyingly respond. And it said, um, they ask a question. Um, have you had COVID? And do you have symptoms for three months after COVID that you never had before? I can understand the question. Now, I'll show you some issues surrounding that, but um, it has uh, told us that, you know, th this was just an earlier cut from this year. Um, about 50% of, uh, of the responders said that they had had COVID. Uh, about a quarter of them said that they had experienced some persistent symptoms. And about 6% said that they were still experiencing some symptom so, um, um, uh, uh, at, a, at a delayed time point um, uh, 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 that may constitute, uh, you know, after three months, that may constitute a, a you know, a large denominator. Um, and about one in four of them said that it was causing significant limitations of their activity. So regardless of how you define it, uh, a lot of people, um, at least a couple million, feel that they uh, have been uh, hard hit uh, by uh, COVID-19. Now, to further classify this and to further dig into this, uh, there have been some very nice studies. Um, this is the, the INSPIRE cohort, um, a collection of um, academic institutions that have uh, been serially assessing about 1,300 adults with COVID-like symptoms, um, all tested and followed every three months for 12 months. This was uh, published a few months ago, and it, you know it, it, it basically said, you know, did you have COVID-19 like illness, and did you get tested for it, and was it positive or negative? So symptoms generally improved but 18% of the test negative patients uh, versus 16% of the test positive patients um, uh, had persistent symptoms beyond three months. So whether you tested positive or negative, um, you had persistent symptoms. Now you can talk about the test operating characteristics of home testing, which most people had, uh, but you know it's not 100% of false negatives. And then extreme fatigue was felt in 6% of the test negative patients versus 3% of the test positive patients. So this really should make us, you know, um, uh, critically examine um, uh, uh, epidemiologic studies going forward. What about pre-existing confounders? This is, an, um, this is a, a point that we're unraveling right now in rheumatology. And there's just a recent abstract at our national meeting last week it, you know, so the question is, you know, do patients with underlying immune diseases to begin with, whether they be autoimmune, rheumatic diseases, or dermatologic, or IBD, or pulmonary, or whatever, when they get COVID, um, do they develop long COVID more frequently because they have an immunologic disease or they're on immunosuppressive therapy, uh, or perhaps less long COVID, being on anti-inflammatory immunomodulatory therapies may parse one of the leading theories of what generates this. And uh, many people uh, who have these immune diseases have fatigue and pain and neurocognitive dysfunction to start out with. And this is a really interesting study done by Laura Bockel um, uh, from the Netherlands. And uh, I can't tell if, if my... Um, the reference has fallen off of here. Uh, this is uh, Lancet Rheumatology, and basically said that uh, uh, when they compared this to a control population, whether you had an immune-mediated disease, um, after adjusting for comorbidities, uh, there was really no statistically significant difference, and that um, uh, the presence of pre-morbid symptoms, such as pain, fatigue, um, neurocognition heavily influenced um, uh, post-acute uh, infectious sequelae. So, um, and uh, similarly, a study just showed this, if you had fibromyalgia, something I'll talk about um, uh, uh, in a few minutes, um, uh, pre just presented by the University of Nebraska group, um, uh, showed the same finding. So, 
Um, the third point that I'd like to make is that we have to recognize that the leading signs and symptoms uh, that form the kind of the infrastructure of long COVID are quite common symptoms in the general population. Um, and it has been posited that all symptoms, um, uh, uh, these quality of life measures, which are patient reported outcomes, are on some type of a continuum, regardless of etiology. And um, patients have a hard time, uh, and we're patients and I have a hard time, um, recognizing you know, what common symptoms that we have at any given time um, are applicable to an inciting um, uh, incident, whether it be uh, influenza or, or a, un a unidentified uh, viral illness or uh, intercurrent mood disorder. Um, studies uh, cited in this uh, really wonderful uh, narrative review on amp symptom amplification by Arthur Barsky, the great placebo nocebo scientist from, from Boston, uh, show that community surveys done randomly um, um, show that 20% uh, of patients, uh, of people who respond to these community surveys, uh, report 10 or more symptoms within the past seven days. Uh, headache and back pain being the most common, but um, fatigue noted in one out of five. Uh, so uh, this needs to be considered. So with those controversies, we await more formal classification criteria that can be tested, and we could all agree to use them in the same studies. So are there risk factors and endotypes? Yeah, so we know a lot about this at the present time. Greatest risk factors uh, for developing long COVID are age, very uncommon in peds. Um, starting at 40, um, uh, it picks up significantly. Uh, clearly a female dominant disorder, though males can certainly get this, but this has been uniformly um, uh, found. Um, severity of the initial disease, and that's interesting. Um, to me, uh, you know, the, the sicker you are, and 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 I'm not just talking about hospitalized or ICU patients here. I'm talking about uh, more persistent um, symptoms in mild to moderate disease uh, has been shown as well. Uh, there have been varying data showing um, um, uh, increased symptoms in in some, looking at minority race and and adverse social determinants of health, but not all studies, um, and premorbid health uh, for sure. Now, if you're younger, you have a milder COVID, you've been vaccinated, um, having previous infection, um, uh, and more recent variants all have been protective, but there are limited data for some of these. And then, um, uh, data I don't have time to talk about, some anecdotal uh, studies on um, antiviral therapy as a um, protector for um, post-acute uh, infectious sequelae, and a very nice uh, RCT uh, showing some very interesting data on metformin, not only in uh, reducing um, long-term sequelae, but also lowering viral load um, uh, at uh, two weeks, um, uh, very provocative, uh, high quality study by uh, David Bowler. Um, now let's turn to talk about what we know about this uh, clinical picture. And these are some of the, you know, I'm not gonna talk about 200 symptoms. I'm gonna talk about the ones that are most common, fatigue and neurocognition, dysautonomia, uh, pain, and uh, I won't talk about pulmonary pain. So fatigue is the elephant in the room. It's the dominant symptom. It's the symptom that we as clinicians least like to discuss with our patients um, uh, for, you know, a variety of reasons that, you know, we could talk about, you know, with hand waving and white wine drinking. Um, you know, we, we're all fatigued to a certain degree on 
any given day. Um, and fatigue does not have a final common pathway or an etiology. Uh, you know, uh, maybe we are in pain and we don't exercise as much, or maybe we don't sleep well and our sleep is non restorative. Maybe we have comorbidities that contribute to this. Um, maybe there are intercurrent mood disorders because, you know, uh, depression, the, the most frequent visceral somatic symptom um, uh, of uh, depression outside of mood uh, is uh, uh, pain and fatigue. Um, uh, so uh, this is hard to sort out. Um, I want to pause here and uh, emphasize a point that if, if any of you interpret my critical appraisal of these data um, to question the gravity or the seriousness or the impact of long COVID or any any skepticism of this, um, I want to parse that right now. Uh, I have been involved in uh, MECFS work for almost three decades. Uh, I see patients with MECFS from all over the world. Uh, I have been part of our recovery program here at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we're working avidly in long COVID. And um, two years ago after Delta, uh, I developed long COVID uh, for uh, probably 16 months and I wrote about it in helio rheumatology. So that's, that's a, a truth telling here. Now I wanna get into the serious matter. And that is uh, the patients with fatigue. It is on a spectrum. And fortunately, most patients have mild to moderate fatigue. And as I will tell you, most patients will improve. However, at the end of the spectrum, and whether this is a linear spectrum or um, uh, some other um, distribution, patients at the most extreme end um, are identical and meet the criteria as outlined uh, by the Institute of Medicine in 2015. Uh, which mandates that they have severe fatigue that interferes with quality of life lasting for six months, um, that their sleep is non-restorative and unrefreshing, and that in particular, they experience something called post-exertional malaise that I don't have time to talk about to a great deal, but that means that activities that you used to be able to do before you developed this with ease, you know, go to the store, pick up the kids, um, you know, take a walk uh, uh, or even make it to the mailbox, um, often result in crashes of, of, uh, of uh, both uh, of, of symptomatology, and that may be pain, neurocognition, um, or fatigability. And those exertions may be physical, intellectual, or emotional. Uh, ask yourself, how often do you ask patients about this? And I know what the answer is. Um, in rheumatology, this is not part of our review of systems, and uh, it's not really only now be starting to be discussed. And then patients should have either neurocognition or some signs and symptoms consistent with dysautonomia. Um, um, uh, th these are the most rigorous uh, criteria. So I'll show you a single study. This is from the Long COVID Clinic at Stanford. This is uh, headed by Hector Bonilla. And he basically looked at this highly biased population of patients that they saw, the first 140 patients, uh, and they scrutinized the data and said, how many of them fit the IOM criteria? And here what you're seeing are the most common symptoms of uh, uh, fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, unrefreshing sleep, um, uh, headache, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the darker, the more severe, the lighter, better. So you can see highly enriched over here. And basically what this, this descriptive study showed is that four out of 10 patients coming to their clinic met IOM criteria for MECFS. And um, many other studies have been done 
um, which show, you know, varying percentages depending upon, you know, how patients come into these clinics and how rigorously they're vetted. Um, but at the extreme end, uh, patients with this look like post-infectious uh, sequelae that we have seen before. But now, given the fact that, you know, a quarter of the planet has been infected by this, there are a lot of people that are suffering from this. This is a devastating illness from which I have rarely seen a patient make a full recovery in, in my entire career. Uh, this is now at your institution, like my institution, an epidemic illness. And, you know, poor postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is merely one and an extreme form of dysautonomia that is highly overexpressed in patients who have recovered from COVID-19. You know, the waiting list to get into our POTS clinic is probably about two years and tilt table testing is high demand. And um, this is a patients who meet full criteria of you know, orthostatic tachycardia without uh, crashing their blood pressure. Um, and this has been reported in, you know, in this little narrative uh, review uh, by over 3% of patients. Now, considering, you know, how many patients have had SARS-CoV-2 infection, we're talking millions of patients. Um, and it also has been described in patients who have had, you um, um, uh, 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 vaccines as well. So uh, we're starting to understand this a bit. Um, studies that have been done with actigraphy show quite clearly that even in the absence of, of POTS, um, there is a rise in uh, resting heart rate that lasts for weeks to months in people that have recovered, particularly with pre-Omicron variants. Um, and uh, if, if you've had COVID, many people have uh, have noted this. Um, the mechanism of this, I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Now, fibromyalgia is the disease that has long been part of the rheumatology continuum, but is now moving its way into pain management. A lot of primary care physicians see this. And if you take care of any patients at all, you see this syndrome, which is one of widespread pain, female predominant, often accompanied by fatigability, neurocognitive dysfunction, um, and other symptomatology. It is now considered part of a um, family of painful syndromes um, uh, that are all related. Many of these are now referred to as nociplastic pain disorders, differentiating it from um, uh, 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 noiceptive pain um, or um, neuropathic pain, and includes things such as, you know, chronic low back pain, um, uh, uh, irritable bladder, functional GI disorders, uh, tension headaches, etc. Uh, we wrote this um, viewpoint in the leading rheumatology journal, international journal, um, uh, several months ago, um, pointing out that there are lessons to be learned from decades of research in fibromyalgia that probably apply to, apply to long COVID, but for some reason, there is a great resistance of this. Uh, I, this is an editorial comment rheumatologists can throw on this, is that somehow in medicine, people with fibromyalgia have been looked at as being uh, weak in, 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 in fiber. Uh, and that in some way, this is a whatever psychosomatic medicine or diseases uh, is. And uh, we're actually seeing uh, battles between patient groups. Long COVID don't want to be called fibromyalgia. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's rather sad and, and interesting. And um, many people are, are kind of uh, 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 shocked and off foot by this. But uh, we believe that there are a lot of lessons here from studying underlying biology for both um, uh, immunopathogenesis and treatment. Finally, sleep disturbances. Uh, this is just some of our data showing that uh, in systematic uh, evaluation of sleep using uh, PROMISE sleep questionnaires, uh, PROMISE being the NIH quality of life database that we all own, um, 
showed uh, that um, a, a high percentage of patients um, uh, uh, 67% showed at least moderate fatigue and 22% showed uh, uh, fatigue, uh, 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 severe fatigue within those uh, that had uh, sleep disturbances. And uh, it, this has been a, an epidemic of sleep. And outside of the POTS clinic, I think that sleep Cognitive Behavioral Clinic is probably the other most backed up uh, clinic here in, in our institution. So now with all that clinical controversy on epidemiology and some of the overview of clinical, what do we know about what's causing this? And this is, this is really getting interesting. And um, there's some great, great science going on. And I think emblematic of that is that only uh, two months ago um, was the first Keystone meeting. Uh, you know, this is as high science as we get in our um, intercollaborative uh, biomedical research um, um, uh, uh, was held on long COVID. And um, uh, a number of, uh, you know, internationally famous scientists uh, presented a lot of abstracts the point is that we don't know at the present time, uh, but there are a number of putative mechanisms. This is a, a very nice uh, narrative uh, by uh, uh, Mike Peluso and Steve Deeks from um, UCSF showing that there are data. Um, and since this was written a year ago, some of these circles, you know, some of these will get more weight, some will get less weight, but I'll show you some data about persistent um, infection, something that is quite surprising to all of us. Um, persistent low-grade inflammation, um, you know, and uh, the for and against that, I won't tell too much, you know, the study by Mike Sneller and colleagues at the NIH, which looked at a large group of people with uh, self-designated uh, long COVID, found no perturbation using clinical tests um, that would be routinely applied to such evaluations, but did, um, uh, but other studies uh, using uh, more deep profiling have shown um, uh, low grade inflammation in these uh, groups. Uh, I won't talk about reactivation of other viruses, but several high power papers um, in high impact journals have shown that uh, predictors of developing long COVID were reactivation of Epstein-Barr during the acute infection. That means actual viremia. But in the chronic forms, after three months, there is no persistent viremia, but an antibody pattern consistent with recent activation. Other viruses uh, have been um, looked at as well, including increased um, reactivity to varicella, um, and some viruses have been protective, uh, including CMV. Um, there are data, um, there have been you know, a slew of studies now looking at microbiomic changes, and uh, several have shown persistent dysbiosis um, at up to 18 months. And it's very interesting because the GI tract may be harboring this virus, as I'll talk about. And then I will make a few comments about hypercoagulability. There is no doubt that patients with long COVID um, and patients who are recovered from COVID uh, have some degree of hypercoagulability. The extreme forms, this has resulted in um, uh, uh, throm thrombotic disease, but even in people who have no clear evidence of thrombosis, um, the microclots uh, uh, that are new and poorly understood are, uh, have been uh, uh, now uh, well-documented by numerous centers around the world. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, the question is, does SARS-CoV-2 infection induce autoimmunity? And then certainly combinations or other mechanisms are on the table since most of the research here, while the technical aspects of it have been 
you know, extraordinary and, and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent in the absence of classification criteria. Um, it is very difficult to duplicate these from center to center. So let's look at a couple of the big ones and I'll show you some good papers if you want to take a deep dive. This is a paper just written in September and published in Nature Immunology. And um, this is by a really a, a leading group of, um, you know, basic and translational scientists, uh, senior author E. John Wary from Penn. And um, this, they have narratively reviewed the question of whether there is viral persistence um, and what that could mean. So, you know, if we think about viruses, the, the expanded family of all viruses, we tr have traditionally, up until very recently, thought of them occurring in three ways. We believe that there are viral infections that we get transiently, you know, rhinovirus, coronavirus, uh, RSV virus, um, things that we're all getting during the year. They come, they engage our adaptive and innate immune systems, and we kick them out. We beat them. Second class would be those persistent in virus uh, infections. The model would be herpes virus group. You're infected with 95% uh, of you have EBV at some point in time in your youth, uh, and you carry that for the rest of your life. Similarly, herpes simplex uh, and varicella. Uh, you know, a third of us will get shingles. Uh, that is. Uh, um, primary and reactivation latency. And then the third uh, family of viruses are those that are chronic and persistently replicating. There aren't that many. Ones that cause pathogens, HCV, HBV, HIV, these are de-accelerating infections. We know a lot about them. We have drugs that are pretty good for most of them. But there are other viruses such as uh, Anelloviridae, Redondoviridae, um, that <laughs> the majority of us have and they're chronically persisting and we really don't know what they do. So no one expected to see SARS-CoV-2 infection after you recovered from this infection. But these are data based on, these are citing the references for finding it in tissue. Um, uh, and this is, uh, you know, uh, 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 biopsy, uh, tissues at autopsy and finding evidence of persistence in blood. Um, the finding it in tissue, uh, finding evidence at the level of persistent protein uh, up to two years after SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients with long COVID, uh, but in the uh, Peluso study, also finding it in people who feel perfectly normal, pulling it out of colonic biopsies. Uh, what does that mean? Is that a persistent source of this? Uh, we don't know. Um, autopsy, autopsy studies are uh, highly problematic. You know, you're dying of, are you dying of COVID-19? Does that mean anything to compared to people who get long COVID after, you know, mildly symptomatic COVID? Uh, some of these studies, such as the study of Stein from the NIH, showed that it, even up to like 10 months later, people who had COVID, who died of other things, um, had, had widespread evidence of of uh, subgenomic RNA, which suggests possible replication um, in many tissues. And then a number of studies have shown the persistence of spike protein in the circulation um, uh, uh, in patients recovering from COVID-19. And again, maybe a somewhat higher level of expression um, in long COVID versus recovered patients, but found in the minority. But it, it is clearly something that we need to think about and needs to be sorted out and is now forming the basis of uh, NIH launched antiviral trials, which, you know, pityingly have not already been completed. Um, hypercoagulability. Uh, this has been shown, you know, from acute COVID-19 to uh, long COVID-19 to people who are asymptomatic. If you 
follow them using detailed studies of thromboinflammation, um, you find some evidence of this. But one of the, the, the features that has knocked everybody's socks off is that there appears to be a novel form of um, hypercoagulability characterized by the presence of microclots, which heretofore had only been described by a single group from um, uh, uh, which originated from uh, South Africa by Risha Pretorius. And what Pretorius uh, and her colleagues have been writing about quietly and largely being ignored um, is that patients with inflammatory diseases ranging from rheumatoid arthritis to other immune diseases, and in particular, um, um, patients uh, post-COVID develop um, these microclots that are, can be found in the circulation. This is just using immunofluorescence. It's a normal person, this person's with long COVID. And what they call these fibrin amyloid microclots are rather novel. Um, they are made from uh, fibrin. Um, they retain their primary amino acid sequence, but in some way have been converted into beta pleated sheets uh, of amyloid morphology. Um, they can reach large size, up to 15 micra. And um, this was largely doubted by most people around the world, but now that this technique has been standardized and can be identified by flow, um, numerous centers uh, from East Coast, West Coast, uh, Western Europe have documented the presence of these. Whether these are causing neurocognition, whether they're causing fatigue, whether they're causing pain, we don't know, but um, there are launching uh, trials of direct and indirect anticoagulants, antiplatelet therapy. Um, uh, uh, I, I'd love to hear what any of the hematologists have to say about this. Uh, I've been talking to our um, uh, um, thrombocoag group uh, for a while about this, and uh, we're, we're doing platelet studies as well. Now, the final thing I'll talk about is uh, autoimmunity and COVID. And um, there had been mixed data on this, um, but um, there's no doubt that following SARS-CoV-2 infection, when you use a, an intense lens uh, to examine autoimmunity, uh, whether it be looking at candidate autoantibodies or using agnostic platforms, looking at the autoantigenome or looking at dysregulated B cells or T cells or um, cytokines, um, there have been a number of studies that have, have identified this. Um, and then also in the long COVID space, um, again, knowing that the patients from this study to this study to this study to this study to this study can't be directly compared because we don't have classification criteria, um, have shown you know, mixed pictures, some showing an interferon signature, some showing the lack of it, some showing autoantibodies, some showing uh, the lack of it. But I, I think that the preponderance is that we see this. I'll show you two little studies. Uh, this I study, uh, This is a study in a, uh, a respiratory journal, uh, but uh, uh, by a German uh, a group collaborating with UT Southwest. And I show this because it's easy to understand. Uh, this is a heat map, and they're looking at subcategories of ANA, different specificities, DNA, uh, all the stuff that rheumatologists look at. Uh, these are these are healthy people, and you know, few people have ANAs of certain specificities. These are people that had respiratory infections and then were tested later, uh, maybe a few more. These are people that had had um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 at home and recovered. And they clearly have some more. And these are people that were um, hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 and looked at, um, um, at at 12 months later. And these are people that were in the unit. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a statistician uh, to see that at least in terms of ANA positivity, um, uh, 
which is something that can be experienced by you know a quarter of young healthy women, um, uh, is it does ensue from SARS-CoV-2 infection. Does this cause symptoms or not? This is not. You can't tell from this study. Um, another study, which I really love, this is one of the best studies of the early phases of the of pandemic, um, done by uh, Tony Kelleher and his colleagues in Australia. They did a very they they took a large group of people that's recovered from song SARS CoV two, and then at four and eight months had persistent symptoms, and and they were fairly well characterized, and they looked like syndromic long COVID. And then they made match controls. And uh, these are people that had um, COVID-2, SARS-CoV-2, and um, they recovered completely. And then they looked at healthy controls um, uh, serially. And then they took people that had non-SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, 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 infections, um, um, uh, with coronaviruses that had evidence of previous coronaviruses. And the bottom line was, is that at eight months, the long COVID group had much more type one and type three interferon um, that remained persistently high at eight months. That's an interferon signature in rheumatology. Now that had a lot of people very interested because that's a driver of a lot of autoimmune symptoms, including things like lupus and Sjogren's and scleroderma and even RA. Uh, but uh, presented at Keystone just a few months ago, uh, showed that by 24 months, it had normalized in all but a small percentage of patients. And maybe those are the ones that are stuck with this. I don't know. Yeah, very provocative. And then, um, I just added this fourth study on. Um, you can't give a talk on long COVID without a, a reference to within the last two weeks. Um, there are at least four studies now that have identified an increased risk of new autoimmune diseases occurring in the wake of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I'm not talking about long COVID, I'm talking about things like rheumatoid arthritis and ankyovasculitis and psoriasis and, and beyond. And if you look at the the incidence of this, these are not trivial. These are you know um, uh, large studies with large numbers of controls. Now the fly in the ointment here is that these are based on EMR, and if people that had SARS-CoV-2 are people that are more well studied, and they have autoantibodies. Are these well curated diagnoses? You know, is this just a woman with a positive ANA who's tired, or is it really lupus? And not all of them show the same data, but this really needs a much more critical appraisal um, to answer this, but it is possible. So now the debate. Uh, this is a heat, hotly debated condition. You know, some people say that it's exaggerated. Do we have it all wrong? Is it just another, is it a disease we've known for a long time? Are we spending too much time on it? Um, it has been associated with a lot of stress and uh, vituperative dialogue, particularly in social media. Um, you know, do we really know the distance? It, it, and CDC criteria says 20% of people have it. The UK says three to 5%. Um, influence of variants, can it be fatal? Um, more than that. Uh, I'm gonna move along to get to the end of this for my questions. Um, I think there's good news that the majority of people will improve. It may take a long time, uh, but the vast majority of people return to a full quality of life, but a small percentage, and however small that is, and these are the people that look like ME-CFS, at least in my practice and others, um, uh, particularly those complicated by disabling dysautonomia, we don't have an answer for them. Treatment. Um, there is no accepted treatment for this. Um, most large clinics, I'm sure you have one, um, are kind of wheel and spoke. They evaluate, make sure that they don't have something else. Not everybody after COVID is suffering from long COVID. Rehabilitation with the pacing technique that 
is not a graded exercise program, psychological support, and what about therapies? Um, there are a lot of therapies. A lot of people are desperate. I, as I say, I have an international practice. I've seen a lot of desperate people seeking desperate measures. Uh, this is a, a very nice uh, study, a uh, large study, uh, by uh, 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 narrative review by Eric Topol, over 300 res uh, uh, references. I just show some of the more interesting things. Uh, pain, fatigue, you know, we treat this very similar to fibromyalgia. There's some small trials going on of low-dose naltrexone. The NIH is launching a blinded um, big study of antivirals uh, going on. And the um, POTS, the most disabling of the symptoms, NIH is launching an IVIG trial. And we are involved um, with a trial of the FCRN antagonist, probably one of the most exciting categories of new immunotherapeutics um, called Fgartigamod. Um, uh, and we're waiting. Uh, there should have been 20 trials completed by now. And I'm very critical of uh, the, the slow walk uh, the FDA and NIH has given us. Um, we can present it by vaccines, not getting it, and maybe metformin, maybe early viral therapy. Uh, my final slide is, you know, I've given you more questions than answers, uh, but I think that, you know, good doctoring is what people with this need. Uh, they don't, they need this, they don't need this. Uh, you know, I like to tell my patients, your symptoms are real, they're not in your head and they're not your fault, and I'm sure you do the same, at least we do that on good days. Uh, and then finally, the slide I've shown for the last hundred grand rounds on this, uh, uh, this is the COVID river. And as Heraclitus says, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. So I will stop on this and open this up for a few minutes of questions. Great, thank you. Um, with a wonderful overview. You you actually alluded to my my first question in your your final slides in talking about the role of vaccinations against COVID and in, in um, mitigating the risk for long COVID. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and how we can? Use yeah, that I mean, our I mean, the data is isn't rigorous, but it's all consistent and it all you know is kind of left shifted uh, in that direction. And I mean, I think that that's intuitively audio, uh, obvious to me. If if one of the dominant risk factors is severity of the primary infection, if you're vaccinated, you're going to have less severe COVID. So uh, it, maybe that's overly simplistic, but I tell people to get vaccinated. You know, I don't, I won't tell you how many times I tell people to get vaccinated because that changes perpetually. But being vaccinated, having hybrid immunity is good, but it's not a guarantee of not of developing. And then my second question is, um, as a critical care physician, we've known for a long time that after any critical illness, um, ARDS, you get a, a significant majority of patients actually get syndromes that are very similar to what we're seeing in the long COVID. So that same question, is it COVID? Is it the illness, the critical illness, particularly in that subset of patients who has severe COVID? How do you separate this out? We look at these people quite differently. Um, uh, uh, we look at this as a non-syndromic, and and yes, you and, and your your field has done very nice work uh, looking at um, you know uh, psychological cofactors and things that have contributed to this prolonged recovery. Uh, th this is a these people are have serious problems, and but I, we look at this separate and distinct from the huge population of people that have mild to moderate COVID that are having this. And, and maybe they have shared mechanisms, maybe they don't, but it, we, we, it is a, a separate order of the day. Okay. Uh, there's a, a question in the chat, um, whether people have tried stimulants for COVID fatigue? Yeah. Um, you know, drugs like uh, modafinil and uh, things that, that, you know, that, that are used for uh, shift disorder sleep. 
uh, the, the, most of these people are, are not suffering from lack of sleep. They are suffering from lack of restful sleep. And those drugs don't do very well for that. Um, uh, so stimulants have not been worked. There's some recent work I'm sure some of you are familiar on with serotonin deficiency in the CNS, very high impact paper in the past month in JCI um, that has kind of energized, you know, wanting to look at, you know, perhaps SSRIs uh, in this, uh, but we don't know much more about it. All right, Dr. Sharkey, I think we are just at time. Do you want to uh, sum up? Yes, um, thank you so much, Dr. Calabrese, for your uh, talk today. I uh, learned a lot of uh, new intersections and pathways of thinking ahead to um, how we're going to treat uh, this per, uh, potentially persistent disease for uh, for some of our patients and also looking at um, further options in rheumatology as well in terms of um, are we going to see new uh, uh, disease after uh, patients with these infections. So we appreciate everybody for coming in today and thank you so much uh, for your time. I was happy to um, respond via email uh, or directly on Twitter. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.